Each year in the United States, thousands of major crimes go unsolved. When the case has gone cold and police have nowhere to turn, they seek assistance from the public. This is a program dedicated to solving these cases. This is Crime Stoppers Case Files. Good evening, and thank you for joining us for another Northeast Ohio edition of Crime Stoppers Case Files. I'm Bob France. There are over 1,400 Crime Stoppers organizations operating around the world. These organizations empower citizens like you to become directly and anonymously involved in fighting crime in our communities. We see the positive impact of this every day right here in Northeast Ohio. Crime Stoppers is an important law enforcement tool, a proactive approach to removing dangerous criminals from the streets and making them safer for everyone. Each week on this television program, we'll share facts with you from unsolved cases, and you'll have a chance to submit information that may help investigators, possibly earning yourself a cash reward in the process without ever having to give your name. So let's get right to work. Our first case dates back to September 5th, 1998, when 26-year-old Rayshawn Thomas was brutally gunned down during an early morning robbery in a friend's apartment. Here's the story. Well, Ray, he was a really good boy. He was my firstborn, so we had a special bond. We grew up in East Cleveland. My brother was three years older than me. He was a good brother. I pretty much treated him like he was a king, so my mother said. The one thing I remember about his childhood is he loved bikes. He liked to make ramps. He liked to jump. He even opened his own little bike shop in the basement, and he used to fix his friends' bikes. He was really smart that way, mechanical. We both went to Superior Elementary School, then we went to Kirk, and then Shaw, but there was a little moving in between there, so we went to different schools. He was a really good student. When he started off, he loved making good grades. He, liked, he was proud of making A's and B's. I had great hopes for him to go to college and be successful. I mean, he was just always a nice, fun person, funny, joked around all the time, cared about his family a lot. He was a really good dad from the day his son was born. He slept on his chest. He loved that little boy. He has a son that is 18 and a daughter that will be 13. Unfortunately, he never got a chance to meet his daughter because she was born after he got killed. In his short life, that was his big accomplishment. He was a really good father. I was proud of him for that. It was September 5th, 1998. Uniform officers responded at about 5.55 in the morning to 15600 Terrace, apartment 1103. Report of shots fired and a mail down. Uniform officers arrived. They began securing the area, talking to various people, and were able to find a victim lying on the floor, along with the leasee of the apartment, a female, and the victim's cousin. Through the course of their investigation, they were able to ascertain who was in the room just prior to the shooting. Essentially, we were able to find out a female friend of the leasee of the apartment came up a little before six o'clock in the morning. When the friend of the leasee came to the door, both the victim and the cousin of the victim were both sleeping. Only the lease of the apartment was up at that point. She opened the door again for her friend, not knowing that there was a male behind her. The male came in and that's when the friend introduced the male. And at some point there was an argument. We're not certain when this firearm was introduced, but it then became a robbery attempt. The suspect ordered the female friend then to find some rope. They weren't able to find any rope. So she began tearing out the phone cords and phone lines from the apartment and individually began tying the victim, the victim's cousin, and the leasee of the apartment up with the telephone cords. And the victim was able to eventually catch free, attempted to tackle the male, then began getting into a physical confrontation where the male picked up a rolling pen and began striking the victim several times in the head. He began to lose the fight and the shooter then shot the victim three times with a semi-automatic handgun, striking the victim twice, one time fatally in the abdomen area. The day that I found out that my brother got killed, something woke me up out of my sleep. And 
sent me outside. So I just went outside and I started cleaning up my yard, probably about six or seven in the morning. I see his friend and he's just sitting there looking at me. And so I'm looking at him and so he rolled down the window and he says, Ray got killed this morning up in the building. Automatically, I mean, I just panicked. So I just called my mother because I had just broke down at that time. And that morning, the phone kept ringing. Before I could answer the phone, I heard a car door close and I heard a wailing cry. And I sat up in the bed and I said, that's my daughter. She came up the steps. I could hear her crying all the way up those steps. And when I opened the door, she just said, Ray's dead. In 1975, the first Crime Stoppers organization was formed by a detective who believed media attention helped solve cases. Since then, thousands of Crime Stoppers organizations have been formed around the globe with the same mission, encouraging members of the public to stand up against crime. Every 14 minutes, Crime Stoppers help solve a crime somewhere in the world. Get involved. Contact your Crime Stoppers organization and learn how you can help. Leave a tip, crimestoppers1.com. On September 5th, 1998, at 15600 Terrace, apartment 1103, Rayshon Thomas was shot and killed on a botched robbery attempt. Essentially, we were able to find out a female friend of the leasee of the apartment came up a little before six o'clock in the morning. She opened the door again for her friend, not knowing that there was a male behind her. The male came in and, and at some point there was an argument and the victim attempted to tackle the male. The shooter then shot the victim three times, striking the victim twice, one time fatally in the abdomen area. The shooter ends up running out of the apartment. The female friend also ran out of the apartment. It is very likely that the male fled into a blue Oldsmobile four-door, possibly a station wagon type vehicle. The leasee of the apartment was able at that point to draw a composite of the shooter. It's actually a very good composite and sort of just hoping that someone might recognize who that composite is. The suspect was approximately 5'11", up to six foot tall, stocky build, medium complexion, large set of glasses. The suspect also was wearing a Miami Hurricanes hat, which was left on scene. There is quite a bit of sweat residue on the bill of the cap. It has been submitted to the coroner's office in hopes for some DNA. These past 13 years have been horrible. <laughs> I miss them so much. So I say that it affected me a lot. I live every day, but in my heart, I'm not over it. And, you know, I, I try to block it out and keep on living. I think it's been hard for his son because he, he was only five when Ray died and he loved him too, so. I think if somebody was brought to justice that, I mean, our family would have closure. You know, his kids would have closure. Like, it's not something that somebody can accept, but you learn to deal with it. You can't change what happened, but at least you know that somebody's not walking the street just at their own free will, knowing that they took a life. Not that it would make my life better to know, but it'll put a stamp on it that, you know, he can rest in peace. And we did everything we could to find out who killed him. Essentially, this case is somewhat run cold. Again, we're hoping someone recognizes the shooter from the composite or has any type of other information. We asked them to contact ourselves. Again, Detective Sergeant Scott Gardner. My partner's name is Reginald Holcomb. Our phone number is 216-681-2162 or contact Crime Stoppers. Witnesses gave East Cleveland detectives a detailed description of the killer from which they created this drawing. Do you recognize this man? If you do, or if you think you do, or if you know anything that can help East Cleveland Police solve this case, please call Crime Stoppers at 216-252-7463. You can remain anonymous and you will be eligible for a cash reward. And we'll be right back with more on Crime Stoppers Case Files.
November 4, 2008 was a historic day for many Americans. On that evening, 31-year-old Gary Griffin went back to his old neighborhood to cast a vote in the presidential election. Afterwards, his car ran out of gas, and while he was waiting for his sister to pick him up, he was approached and shot. Here's the tragic story. When he was born, he came faster than all the kids. It only took me two hours to have him. All the rest of them took me like 14, 16. Me, my two brothers, and my little sister, we've always been a close-knit family, no matter what was going on. So he was more than just my little brother. He was like my son, too, because my mother and father used to work. So I used to babysit, you know, and I know what my mother's going through because I feel like I lost my son, too. He was my golden child. He was Gary Griffin Jr. He looked just like me, and he was just fun-loving. He was mischievous, but he was fun-loving. He was one of the coolest people that you could be around. We were best friends, you know. That was my baby, even though we were only a couple years apart, but that was my baby. I'm seven years younger than my brother. So by us being so many years apart, we never really got a chance to spend time with each other all like that. But the times that we did spend with each other, we made the best of them when we did. He looked out for me and always protected me. It just was so fun to be around him because he was just a loving person. He always made you laugh. He would get a smile out of you regardless if you met or not. Life would start catching up with him. He was in and out of prison. So I could only see him at glimpses here and there, so I just stuck around and waited for him to get out. I just loved him for just being there when he could and when he was able to. He had just got out of jail. He was working two jobs. He was working and talking about going to college and got his GED. And we really started to bond. He started, Daddy, I want to get my life together. He was just bursting out with energy, wanting to do something with his life. I said, I was so proud he took on a ready-made family with three girls and they loved him to death. And everybody said, she got to be part of you because she looked just like you. I said, well, she's my son's daughter, you know? I said, she looked just like you. And I told him a couple of days before he got murdered, I was so proud of him. We never really had that relationship until right before he got killed. He called me every morning. Him and my husband talked every morning. It was just a beautiful thing. I just felt like I just got me a best friend. Can't nobody take this from me. And I really thought they was going to have a bright future. I thought the whole family was going to have a bright future. I thought things were really changing around for the better for our family. Now I'm going to murder the city of Christ, please come to us for fire. I'm walking down the street on Hampton, man. They're going to shut this boy up. He's landing in his car. I'm scared to see him. I'm not. I need you to calm down. Where are you? I'm terrified. I know. I understand. Where are you? Like, ma'am, he looks like he's dead. I understand, but we I can't get you any help if we don't know where you are. We are Hampton, 105 and Hampton. On November 4th, 2008, Gary Griffin Jr., a 31-year-old African-American male, was driving his car east on Hamden Avenue when he happened to run out of gas at about 10617 Hamden Avenue. At this time, he called his older sister in order to drop off some gas at his location. This particular night happened to have been an historic night for the United States of America in that Barack Obama was elected president of the United States. While I was on scene investigating, I heard a lot of people celebrating. I was talking to him on the phone. I asked him, I said, did you vote, son? He said, no, nah, Dad, I ain't voted yet, but you know, I'm waiting on some money for some gas to go vote. He said, Dad, my one vote ain't gonna make no difference. He said, but I'm gonna see what I can do. After running out of fuel and speaking with his sister, Gary walked several houses down the street to speak with an acquaintance. After a few minutes of conversation, Gary then walked back to his vehicle and sat in the driver's seat. A few minutes later, a black male emerges from the shadows of the abandoned house where Gary Griffin Jr. was parked, walked toward the vehicle, stood at the driver's side of the vehicle and fired four shots through the driver's window into Gary Griffin Jr. The wounds entered his body on his left side and he died immediately at the scene. Two minutes later, his younger sister arrived with fuel to assist him in getting out of the neighborhood. Before I could even touch the car, the glass just falls to my feet. When I open the door, I'm calling his name. He don't respond to me. 
So I'm looking, and I'm trying to look at his head to see, did they shoot my brother brains out? So when I grab on his coat, his head rolled, and he got a gunshot wound in his neck. My next phone call was her calling me, screaming. No, I couldn't do nothing but scream. My brother had been shot in his neck. He not even responded to me. I get a call that he'd been shot after he voted, and I almost lost my mind. If I had told him to go vote, maybe he wouldn't even been over in that situation and got killed. And that bothers me. We'll be right back with more on this story when we return to Crime Stoppers Case Files. Welcome back to Crime Stoppers Case Files. We now return to the case of Gary Griffin Jr. Oh my God! 911, did he police, fire, or not? Please, please, my brother is dead. Somebody just shot him. I'm out there, please. Someone just stabbed please. your brother? You shot him in the head. Please, please. Okay, ma'am, ma'am. Where's the person please. who shot him? We don't know. We may call your family with an answer. All right, listen, you have to calm down to help your brother out. On November 4th, 2008, while being stranded on Hamden Avenue, Gary Griffin Jr. was shot four times with a 45 caliber semi-automatic pistol. And after the shooting, the suspect fled through the yards. We're pretty confident that the suspect does live within a few blocks of where the crime was committed. We believe the shooter to be a black male in his late teens to early 20s about six feet to six feet one inches tall and approximately 170 pounds. His hair was close cropped. His skin was dark in complexion. He was wearing a hooded sweatshirt along with dark colored pants or jeans and athletic shoes. I used to always hear people say how they stumbled up on dead bodies, just walking in and seeing somebody dead on a house porch or something. And I used to ask myself, I wonder will I ever stumble up on somebody like that? And I did, and it was my, my own brother. Whether you're caught or not, you took your own life also. If you're never caught, you still have to live with this. I don't know how you're living with it. If you're a human being, you can't live with it. How can you sleep at night knowing that you took my brother from me, knowing that you got his mother in pain? He don't know what he did. He tore his family up. He really messed his family up. And sometimes I sit there and wish I was dead so I could see my son again. It would mean the world to me because I know it would make my mother and father feel so much better. Please, just my mother is killing her. He never even got a chance to even know his daughter good. His daughter don't even really know nothing about him because they took him from her. All she knows pictures. That's my daddy. So I would want justice done because of the fact that they took him away from his daughter. We're asking the public for your help in solving this crime. I'm Detective Arthur Eccles. My partner on this case is Detective Lim Griffin. You can call either one of us at 216-623-5464. That's the Cleveland Police Department's homicide unit, or you can call Crime Stoppers, where you can remain anonymous and receive a cash award up to $2,000. Imagine finding your own brother shot in his car. Gary's family experienced this, and they're now desperate for justice. If you know anything about this case, we need you to call Crime Stoppers right now. You can remain anonymous, and you'll be eligible for a cash reward while helping to bring a killer to justice. Thank you once again for joining us for another episode of Crime Stoppers Case Files, where you are empowered to help clean up our streets. Remember, our towns and our neighborhoods are a direct reflection of what we allow them to be. So let's all do our part to make them safe. And we'll see you next week for another edition of Crime Stoppers Case Files.